Amen. Be seated. Be seated. Well, I want to welcome you once again to Truth Point Church this morning. I'm Tim Sansbury. I'm the interim pastor here. And if you're just joining with us, beyond saying especially to you, welcome. Um, we want to let you know we're kind of you're jumping into the middle of a series we've been doing, working through the book of Hebrews. Uh, if you're if you're here with us, if you're ready, if you've got if you've got a paper Bible or if you've got an electronic Bible, if you want to go to Hebrews 11. But if you're in if you're in the old version, if you're in the paper version, you can also start putting your fingers into Genesis 6 and Genesis 12. But for those of you joining with us for the first time, we're in that part of Hebrews that's called the Hall of Heroes by many people, where the author of Hebrews has been talking to his audience, and we've been hearing this. He's been sick saying, listen, Jesus is all the sacrifice you need. Jesus has taken care of all of the debt of your sin. Remember, remember the joy that you had at, the, at hearing that salvation that was worked through him. Remember how you guys together, remember all the great things you were doing. And, and he's saying to a, to a group of people who seem to be kind of losing their enthusiasm, and, and it seems like some of them are even turning back to the old ways that they had lived before, and he's saying, no, hold firm, keep going, be encouraged, encourage each other, get together. And then he starts off in this section called the Hall of Heroes. We call it the Hall of Heroes. That's not in Scripture. We, this, this, this story after story of people who are part of the history of the faith, and this week, if you want to look right now, we're going to start off this week, we're going to hear about Noah and Abraham. And so we're going to be reading Hebrews 11, 7 through 10. And this part's in your bulletin, if you want to just take a look right there. In Hebrews 7, we hear this. Remember this context of, of being encouraged. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to, when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So here you hear that formula, the by faith formula. That's this series. This is the by faith part of the Hebrew series. By faith, by faith, by faith. Every story is going to start with by faith. And if you remember last week, last week we had the by faith story of Abel and the by faith story of Enoch. And what we heard was that by faith, their lives, their day-to-day -day work, Abel's offering was sanctified, was made holy. Even though they were imperfect, God walked with Enoch. And even though Abel was fallen and, and sinful, God accepted his sacrifices. This week, we have a different kind of by faith. This week, we have a by faith where two people, Noah and Abraham heard God's call, heard God's command, heard God say, hey, go do something. And they did it. It's a long obedience. You're going to see two examples of a long obedience. As we look at this and we try to make this, we try to, we try to not only hear what God's word has said, we try to understand how to apply it to our lives. Let's, let's open up, let's go to the, word, the, the Lord in prayer and ask him to open up his word to us and also to help us to be encouraged as the author was trying to encourage his people. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'll open your word to us this morning. Lord, help us to hear these stories of those who went before us, the stories of people who you, you called. Lord, in, in the case of Noah, in the case of Abraham, people whom you called specially to these great works. Lord, people who stuck with it who did, not just them, but in their community, their families, um, the whole household we hear of Abraham, they went and they followed you. And they held fast to the faith, and that by faith, they did obey the promise. By faith, they did a long obedience, answering your call. 
And that now we know those stories because out of their long obedience, you worked part of your history of the redemption of your people. Stories that we need to hear and be encouraged, that we would be reminded to fall back on Christ, to realize that he has done everything for us, and to live together as a community seeking to serve you in your world. That those of us that know you already will be strengthened in our walk, and then those who have never hear the go- heard the gospel will know for the very first time that Jesus Christ is the only and perfect Savior offered for all mankind. In your name we pray. Amen. When I, when I opened up this section, I've, I've shared a little bit and kind of laughed. And I mean, it's, it's a laugh for me. It's probably not a laugh to all of you. But I'm not very good all the time at coming up with like kind of modern illustrations of what's going on. Sometimes it just doesn't happen. I'm like, it there's got to be a play, and often people will talk to me afterwards, and you say, no, it would have been a great illustration. I'm like, that would have been a great illustration. How do I preach first, then have people give me illustrations, and then come back and preach? And that, the timeline hasn't worked out for me. But this week was different. This week, almost immediately upon reading these, somebody came to mind. Now, I think many of you will know her name. If you don't know it, you'll probably know the story. The person that came to mind immediately was Elizabeth Elliot. <laughs> this happened when I was preparing, too. And I, I don't fully get where it happens. But Elizabeth Elliot, so if you don't know her name, Elizabeth Elliot was a missionary. And she wasn't just any missionary. Elizabeth Elliot was the missionary who went to Ecuador after feeling a call apparently in high school. So she went to college already ready to be a missionary. And what she wanted to do is she wanted to go to places where the word has never been translated before. She wanted to bring the Bible for the first time to people who'd never heard it. And she felt that call. She went to college for it. She did master's work for it. She got married to somebody who said, we can't get married until you've perfected this language for the people we're going to go work with, which is... A little odd. I probably would have said, let's get married first, and then we'll work on the language together. Um, but they, she, then she goes to Ecuador. She's doing ministry. She, um, they have, she, she and her husband have a baby. And when the baby's 10 months old, her husband is killed. Speared by whom? By the people he was going to minister to. And what did she do? little kid in a foreign country, what would you do? I'd probably pack up and go home, say, I obviously didn't hear God's call right. Not only did she stay, but she started learning the language, not of the people she'd been working with already, but of those people that her husband wanted to go work with. She learned their language, and she went to work with them. She went to minister to the very people who took her husband from. And then after working with them for a while, she went back with the original tribe. She worked in Ecuador for a number of years. Finally, she came back, returned to the United States, started working. I mean, amongst all the glorious things, she was for a while even a seminary professor. But putting that part aside as not so glorious, she wrote books and she went. She did a radio program. She encouraged the people of faith with her story. She kept telling them, look, hold fast, hold firm, like the author of Hebrews. She's one of those people that if I were writing this today, I'd say, by faith, Elizabeth Elliot went. By faith, she persevered. By faith, she stayed in the forest when things went wrong. By faith, she returned and shared her story. By faith, she encouraged people all across the United States and the world. And by faith, she persevered to the very end and is remembered now as someone who impacted the world for Christ by faith. That's the kind of That's the kind of by faith story that would be a modern story. That's what what the author of Hebrews has given to us, somebody who by faith carried through to the end, somebody who received her reward. And those are the stories we've got. So if you want to turn to Genesis, we're going to talk about Elizabeth Elliot again. um, Because many of you are probably going to be able to be encouraged just by the front end of today. Just by hearing these stories. But I suspect some of us, the stories won't work right away. And we're going to hear about her again. Because if you're one of the people who actually hearing this great story, instead of making you feel encouraged, makes you feel defeated, I'm nothing like that. We've got a word for you as well. 
But let's first do the positive side. Let's get to the, let's get to the good story. So let's turn here to Genesis 6. We'll start in chapter 11. It's a long story. We're not going to read all of it. For you kids, I'm going to try to read because these are the stories you guys probably know better than your parents do. You've, their parents have probably heard it. You guys probably know the details and can, can, can correct them if they don't get them quite right. But let's start here. Chapter 6, verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark. An ark was a boat. You probably know that, but just it's a boat of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch, like tar, to make it waterproof. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. A cubit is about a foot and a half, maybe a little bit more. So 300 cubits, about 450 feet long. Its breadth, 50 cubits, about 75 feet. Its height, 30 cubits, you know, probably right around 45 feet. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you. Remember, a covenant is a permanent promise. And you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. If we stop there, there's just what you can make a note of. There's two places in 622 and 75 that we need to pay attention to. Because in 622, it says, Noah did this, speaking of the whole command. He did all that God commanded him. And in 7.5, it says, and Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. So now let's, let's look back again at Hebrews 11. If you want to flip quickly or go to the other window. Again, this is what the author of Hebrews says. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Just something to remember if you were here at the very beginning of this section, you may remember the author of Hebrews talked about faith in this place that looks kind of like a definition, but we said it's not meant to be a definition, it's meant to be an illustration. He says, one of the the things says, faith is the assurance of things unseen. And we said that, that word, and then he uses the word conviction about things not yet. These words, assurance and conviction, remember we, we heard the word assurance can also be translated as foundation. It it can also be translated as sort of a a place, a firm place, like a rock. And we talked about a a place we stand to go and act. And that word for conviction, which sounds again like a feeling word, is, is also used for evidence, for proof. So both of these parts were, uh, as we started this, by faith. It was, it was by faith. By, by standing assured, by holding tight, Noah, being told what's coming, carried out the building. He was told by God, this is coming, build an ark. And he built the ark. Now, we don't know exactly how long it took, but there's people, and I didn't go duplicate the math or double check it, so you can believe me that somebody has said this, and then if it's wrong, just go talk to them. Uh, It looks like if you look at the ages of his kids and if you look at the various pieces of story, probably 50 to 70 years. Probably 50 to 70 years is what it took to build the ark. Noah had a long obedience. Noah had a long obedience. He stood firm. But what came out of the end of it? At the end of it, we get that part. I mean, this is the part we, we don't spend 50 to 70 years telling the story. We say 50 to 70 years, and then all the ark is built. The animals come in. God seals the door. The floods come. God maintains his family throughout the flood. He maintains the animals. Finally, the floodwaters recede. They're drawn out. We get the rainbow as a covenant sign, a marker, an indication that God will never do that again. 
He promises. He makes a covenant with Noah. And Noah stands as one of those people because of, because of the ark, one of those forefathers for whom that covenant is with us too. It won't happen that way again. Noah gets the promise, and for 50 to 70 years he obeys, and out of his obedience comes great good for all of us. Then we can go and we can look at Abram. Now, Abram, we, we, we're, we're going to hear more from. We're going to hear from Abram and Abraham and Sarah next week and then again in a couple of weeks when we talk about Abraham and Isaac. Abraham, uh, if you remember, uh, over 50% of the world's population sees Abraham as an important guy, right? Abraham is not only important in Christianity. Abraham is obviously the father of Judaism, but Abraham is also recognized as this critical, important religious figure for the Muslims. And so over 50% of the world's population looks back at Abraham as that guy's life was important. That guy's life changed things. Now, some people adequately and some people inadequately, but still, his life produced a change that still today is that big. So what do we hear in this part from Abram? So look at Genesis 12. We're just going to read 1 through 5. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran, and Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. And what does Hebrews tell us in verses 8 through 10? By faith, Abraham, remember Abraham's name gets changed later from Abram to Abraham. By faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So we have that same pattern, right? Just like last week, we had the pattern of faith sanctifying actions. Here, faith, it's by faith that we obey. And just in case you've, you've forgotten this part or it's, 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 um, it's, not, it's new to you, notice that a lot of people tend to make Christianity into a by obedience we get to salvation. But here, faith, which is the foundation of our salvation, comes first. By faith, then we obey. And that's what the author of Hebrews has been saying to us over and over again. And we need to be reminded of it when the opportunity is there. Rest on Christ. Christ. Know Know who he is and holding fast to that foundation by faith. Now let's go and obey. Let's work together in obey obedience. So the faith, the foundation, the reality of our righteousness comes first and the obedience comes after. But for, this, for, the, for the story that we've got here, we've got Abraham being given a promise from God. 75 years old. God says, I need you to pack up and go. Just go to this land, and out of you I'm going to bless all nations. Now, how does Abraham bless all nations? It's not because 50% of people think Abraham is important. It's because out of the line of Abraham, out of the covenant that God made with Abraham, comes Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, out of the covenant with Abraham comes a blessing to all the nations. Abraham's obedience blessed everybody, everywhere, by packing up his tents and by going. And again, we're going to hear even more from Abraham. All were blessed. You and I may not have any genetic descent from Abraham. We may not have any part in Isaac. We may not have a place in the person Abraham with respect to his descendants. And yet, because Jesus was one of his descendants, 
And because Jesus came here and lived and fulfilled the covenant and died and is resurrected and stands in heaven ready to receive all people, you and I have been blessed by him. All of us in Abraham. Abraham, by faith, holding firm, obeyed. And you and I, now thousands of years later, are blessed by his obedience. So let me remind us again of where the author of Hebrews is going. I said we're going to read this every single week. It's tempted to make it kind of the memory verse, except I don't know that it, I don't know if it has that much long term for everybody. But let's hear Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. This is what comes at the end of this long by faith section. Remind ourselves once again of what this is for. And then if you're one of those people that rather than being encouraged is feeling discouraged, let's walk away with a way for all of us to come away encouraged this morning. So Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, right? All of the by faith stories, the ones we've done, the four we've done, the many we're going to do. All of those people, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, these people who've gone before us, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what is the joy set before him? You and me, us his church, the salvation of his people was the joy set before him so that he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So hearing this great cloud of witnesses, the author of Hebrews wants us to say, come on, hold fast, endure, have a long obedience. But see, here's something I suspect. I, I know what happens to me. I suspect that a lot of us, when we hear these great triumphant stories, rather than being encouraged that I should keep working in my little life that really doesn't matter that much, I actually get discouraged, right? I, man, I'm not an Elizabeth Elliot. I'm no Noah. I'm no Abraham. God built the foundation of the church. That's great that he used them in these wonderful ways, but... I'm not like that. I'm just a regular old person. And in fact, if somebody was walking around here in the church saying, I'm going to be as important as Abraham, we'd probably try and shut him down. I doubt it. Maybe we wouldn't. Maybe we just watch and say, just hang out. This is going to be spectacular. <laughs> but I, I, it's, it, it feels almost like it would be wrong for me to go and say, I'm like them. But one of the things that happens to us a lot is we forget when we hear great stories that all great stories get told because of the end, but they've always got a middle. And I want us to think for a little bit about the middle of these stories because the author of Hebrews is talking to people like us. He's talking to, he's talking to just people, just the church. It's the early church. It's a Jewish church, but it's like us. People who have set their faith on Jesus Christ or people who are in hearing about Jesus Christ, listening to the word. And notice what he says. He says, if I can find it, he says uh, right at the very end of, of verse 1, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us run the race that's set before us. See, he doesn't say every one of you has to be a hero or else you've fallen down. He actually says every one of you has been called. He's been spending all this time saying every one of you is loved by Christ. Your lives matter. Obey every one of us. What race should you run? Abraham's race? No. Noah's race? No. Elizabeth Elliot's race? Probably not since you're here. But maybe if you're young but probably not, and still not hers. Which race? The race set before you, the race you're in the middle of. And see, when I say every story's got a middle, let's go back through some of these and let's think about what it was like, not at the end after everything was glorious, but what was it like in the middle of those stories? 
So think about Abraham, since we looked at him last. What did Abraham do? Abraham, at 75 years old, just packed up and moved. And he didn't, like, call U-Haul and say, I want you to send me a truck and about seven or eight people to come over, bring a bunch of boxes. I know it's going to be expensive, but I've got the money. Just get this all taken care of. And it wasn't like he just got into a nice comfortable car and took a ride to the destination and waited for his stuff to arrive. Moving, it essentially, he became nomadic. He lived in tents, it says, for the rest of his life. He gave up his home, and he went to a place where God says, this will be the home of your descendants, and they will all be blessed. But what did he experience? He experienced living in tents in a land that wasn't friendly and that he wasn't the owner of and moving around for his whole life. This would be, to make it kind of like today, it'd be like me taking you to a really, really nice lot over on the water and saying, this is where your grandparents our grandchildren are going to live. Now, what I want you to do is sell everything and just live in a tent here. Like, that's great for my grandkids, but how about we do this a little differently? Especially 75, go live in a tent. Now, he seems to have been a fairly hale 75, but still, this was not in the middle a great life. And that long obedience was not one where every day, there's no reason to believe that every day Abraham went through this going, this is going to be great for my grandkids. I'm so happy for the future. As he traveled, as he lived, we know they fell into sin. We know that as we're going to look at other promises, we know Abraham and Sarah both struggled with being truthful about who their relation, what their relationship was, with having hope in God's promises. This wasn't something where God came down one time and said, everything's going to be good in the future, and Abraham spent the rest of his life happy. Just like you and me, in the middle, I assure you it was hard. And by faith is not superhero. I popped it open. I was about to feel sad, but I ripped my shirt open and showed off the F for faith and was happy. That seemed like it was going to work better, but texting has ruined things for faith. And we're going to, and, and then I was happy, and it didn't matter that I was living in a tent at 75 years old and things haven't happened yet. But rather, if we have that image of faith as the foundation, the thing we cling to, I imagine, I expect, and I'm going to claim a couple more times, that what Abraham was doing was clinging. I remember it. I don't think it was bad goat. God, he talked to me. He said, go there. It's going to be good. And he clung to that promise because I can almost guarantee you, and the text gives us evidence, that it was not easy and happy along the way. And what about Noah? What about Noah? Noah, I mean, you got to take a boat ride. I like boat rides. It was probably a smelly boat ride, but I mean, exhaust or whether it's a, you know, diesel engine or it's an elephant, you got some weird smells in a boat, but still, you're on a boat. It's a long boat ride, and out of that boat ride, you got a covenant with God. You get rainbows. You get a permanent promise. You get the salvation. 50 to 70 years. Now, I don't know about you. One of my least favorite things in the whole world is public embarrassment. I just despise it. My mom tells me it's because we're Danish and that that's part of what, like, our culturally, we just don't ever want to do anything that will make anybody look at us. Just keep it calm. Carry on. Things will be all right. I can't imagine spending 50, let's call it only 50. In fact, we'll give it 45. For only 45 years, I'm going to stand in a field making a boat in a place that obviously the boat didn't have opportunities to float for the whole 45 years that I was building it, or else the project would have floated away. I'm just going to stand. I'm going to be building a boat. There's God's, God's judgment is coming. There's indications that along the way, Noah's probably preaching to people, hey, listen, at the end, you need to repent. But nobody was going to listen, and nobody did listen. And for 45 years, he's building a boat in a field. How did that feel? The text doesn't give us any indication that God came back and reminded him. It doesn't give us any indication that on a day-to-day basis, Noah could say, God, tell me again why I got this hammer. Because 
it seems weird. It doesn't give us any indication that God gave him some special faith where he could get up and say, let's get to it. Only 43 years to go. (laughs) This story had a middle. And that middle was hard and long. And I don't know exactly what it was like, and we can speculate, but we know that God doesn't say there are some special people who are just so holy that I choose them. He says we're all in this together, and we're all broken and flawed, and I think it's fair to say whatever that 50 to 70 years was like for Noah, it was obedience, but it wasn't perfect and happy and joyful obedience at every moment. And so let's talk about Elizabeth Elliot. I haven't read much of her works, but somebody sent me uh, the really interestingly titled book, The Liberty of Obedience. It's one of her early books. It's a really interesting one. It's only about 90 pages. Worth, it's worth picking up and reading. But one of the things that's interesting about this book is here's somebody who has, there's, a, there's an analogy to the stories here because she feels a call to the mission field. But this book is about her early experiences going into the mission field, all the expectations she had for how it was going to go. All of, this is what I'm going to do and what success is going to look like and how she's going to meet these people that have never heard the gospel and they're going to, their, their lives are going to reflect that they, that they haven't heard the truth and she's going to translate the word and immediately they're going to be converted and, and she tells this story and she tells you those things because They were all wrong. That early story of her early walk was one of all of her expectations failing. It's one of her holding fast. I'm supposed to be here to do missions work, and I'm going to obey that call even though I think missions work is supposed to be for the conversion of people. And so far, the only person that's getting converted is me from thinking that way to thinking this way. Her description in the middle is not the story that would lead you to think, I'm being used by God. The description of her story there, the middle of her story, the kind of place where you and I are, is a description of, I don't even understand. This isn't working right. This isn't what I expected. This isn't what I thought. Now, it's got a grace and peace, and I don't want to make it sound like it's whiny. It's not that at all. But still, it's got this element of standing and holding on to faith. Because if what faith is all about was having my expectations confirmed, if what living for Christ was like was all about making a visible impact, she didn't have it either. And we look back on our story from the end and we say, I wish God would use me like that. But if you go look at her story in the middle, she would say, me too, because he's not. But we're in the middle. Look, what's the race set before you? There's lots of long obediences that get set before us. Parenthood is a long obedience. Marriage is a long obedience. Relationships with each other are long obedience. The calling that God has put on you, your vocation, that word vocation means calling. Your job, your work We understand missionary is not more called than insurance salesman. Missionary in Ecuador, mother in Ecuador, is not more called than mother in West Palm Beach. College student doesn't have to be aimed at seminary to be more called. Vocation is a big part of what we're supposed to do, the work that we're supposed to do, whether it's the paid work or the work in the church, that is the race set before you. And your story has a middle, and we're in it. The author of Hebrews was writing to people in the middle of their stories. Now, I don't know if your story or my story will have anything fancy in the end here on earth that makes people 75 years from now say, by faith... Tim Sansbury did anything. Hopefully I'll have some grandkids that remember my name. My story doesn't have to have that kind of ending because here's the part that the author of Hebrews has already told you. All of your stories do have a good ending. 
If you're here and you haven't heard the word of the gospel, the word of the gospel is this. If you set your faith on Jesus Christ, if you say to him, Lord, I'm hopeless, I'm helpless, my sin overwhelms me, I can't get right, save me. Every effort I have made has failed. Then he promises, I will do that. I have done that. You are mine. And he calls you into a community of broken people like us, like you. And he promises the end of your story is now written. And it's with me. And maybe the race set before you here on this earth will be fancy. And people will talk about it later. But it doesn't matter. Because the ending of the story that matters was written 2,000 years ago in Christ. And that's how these fancy stories, big stories, that have great endings should remind you that even better is the ending promised to you. So now in the middle, when it feels like I'm building a boat in a field, be encouraged, carry on, and encourage each other. We're in the middle. Hold fast to the thing that's to come because the story at the end is perfect and beautiful and permanent. Let's pray. Father, we're in the middle of a a lot of different stories. Lord, I'm sure that some of us are here this morning in the middle of some of the hardest parts of our story. Lord, we're in the middle of parts where we're starting to wonder. Maybe we're just starting to wander. Maybe we're just starting to forget. Lord, as the author of Hebrews wrote to us, like he wrote to his people, to say, hold fast, hold firm. Encourage each other. Keep each other going. Lord, help us to be encouraged. Help us to be, if we're not in the middle of those hard parts, help us to be the encourager, to reach out to those who are struggling. Lord, help us to be a community that calls each other together, that remembers the great stories, that reminds each other of the beautiful ending that you've promised to all of us, and so carries each of us through our middles. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't we all stand as we sing this last song? Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom. Down here we pray. Now set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil what you were made. Come set our hearts ablaze. Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit come invade us now We are your church And we need your power in us Build your kingdom, build your
sick the for the peace we lay down our lives for heaven's heart as we are your church sing it out and we pray revive this earth yeah. Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear, show your mighty hand, heal our streets, and then set your church on fire, win the nations back, change the The microphone matters a little. I can fill a room, but I can't fill the internet. So I'm going to try and move this one. Well, I mean, hope, hopefully. Um, usually that only happens for embarrassing stories. Hey, here's the fantastic news. If you are in the middle of a story that is hard, slow moving, that feels broken, that isn't working, remember, and if you don't know this, hear it for the very first time. In Jesus Christ, the end was written. Your story ends in heaven. So live with endurance the race set before you, even in the times it feels empty and broken. Because in Jesus Christ, in your relationship with him, his promise is your sins are forgiven. And so we hear this from 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let's go in peace. If you're here, we're going to do the Lord's Supper. If you're watching on the internet, let's go on that firm foundation. Our labor, no matter how it looks to us, is not in vain. Amen.